I'm a professor of religion at Haverford, the religion department. I teach mostly in Jewish studies. So modern Jewish thought, material religion in America like I'm teaching now. And then I share my position with my wife. So we both have a job share in her field's ancient Jewish history, mine's modern Jewish thought. We're going into our 18th year. So it came in 1997. Okay, great. It's a good place. Okay. For both of us, because she's a, it's a Barnard and because I was a Haverford graduate, this is the kind of place we wanted to be at. You know, we, we had options. It could have been at bigger universities, but when I imagined what it would be like to teach and to, to do my research, it was a place like this. It wasn't, I didn't think at all I was going to come back to Haverford, but it was something like this. That, so the attraction of it was in part because of that undergraduate. That's what I thought college was about. Right, right. It's a great life. Our kids, we live on campus. There are three kids that run around. They, love, they actually like being on campus. They like being those faculty brats. I like walking to work in five minutes. I like that I can zip home if I have to take care of one of my kids. I took a class in religion with Ronald Thiemann when he was teaching here. Uh, it was a uh, UCA, an upper class advisor, who said, you know, Thiemann teaches this great class, you should take it. And I was just, with the other 80 kids in that class, just blown away. I, I, I never thought people thought this way. You know, I, I didn't grow up in a religious household. It, wa it was a kind of way of thinking about the world that, that, that resonated with a certain kind of sense of significance or meaning that I had not had any kind of contact with. Mm -hmm. And then the personal relations with faculty that were important to me, especially as I became interested in education, and then they become mentors and models for who I wanted to be. And the thing about Thiemann is um, he, you know, he was here my first year, and then he became provost and president, moved on to become um, dean of, of our divinity school, but he kept in touch with me. He sort of followed me, and I was really, you know, touched by that. He didn't have to do that. It said something about the nature of the folks that do this kind of thing at a place like this. Right, yeah. I went to um, Harvard Divinity School to do a master's. I take a free class in a language. And I, said, I remember I had to decide between Hebrew and Greek. And I still remember, you know, sitting at my grandmother's grave and thinking through this. Did I take Hebrew to Greek? I took Hebrew. And all of a sudden, when I, when I started to take Hebrew, I felt as if my studies were not studies of something object or something other, but that it was closer to home. It was kind of working out some of those issues of identity. I was a kid like me growing up in a secular household, but becoming more and more committed to the tradition and, more, and now living in a household that keeps kosher and Shabbat and all those kinds of understanding that move. I, I recognize my own sense of fairness, my own sense of engaging an other has been informed by my time here. And I think that also informs how I practice my Judaism. There's an issue here about whether we're receptive to spirituality, whether we're receptive to religious practice, particularly our religion departments. On the one hand, yeah, we want to be open to these kinds of questions. On the other hand, we also want to articulate what it means to study these cultures. There's a kind of atmosphere, a kind of community that's established here with honor code, with notions of, of consensus. The Quaker ethos of that kind of spirit in everyone or that kind of openness that provides a framework and a kind of the ether that's in the classroom within which I do that thing. I suppose the students have changed over 18 years. I'm not exactly sure how I would, how would I articulate that change. I almost want to say they're more interesting than me. I'm in a discipline. I'm, I sort of work in the discipline of religion. But when students come to that classroom, they're taking four, four other classes okay. and they're bringing that in. So we got some people are interested in psychology, anthropology, or ethnography. They have a kind of eclectic openness that as we get older in years, we've lost and lost and lost because we become focused more focused. I don't know all the time you know, what my students' financial pictures are and where, so who's coming from, from where. I think we've become increasingly worried, as, as I think all these institutions are, that we are reproducing ourselves, that we are an elite that's actually keeping out people, so that we are not a gateway to fulfillment or somehow to citizenship. We're actually blocking it out for a whole group. So in that sense, Th that financial aid and the capacity for folks not only to think, hey, they can go to Haverford, that we can p help pay for them, yeah. but, but that it actually enables a certain kind of uh, life afterwards. It also has to do with issues of diversity, both economic and other, other kinds of diversity. Mm -hmm. And, and this is what I hear from students too, it's not just about getting numbers here. It's about having a certain culture that enables the, this diversity to actually flourish. Part of what Haverford does, because we're small, you reach out across the disciplines and departments and you, and, you, and you can spread your interest out. For me, I want students, when they come into the classroom, I want them to slow down from all the gadgetry and all the stuff that they do, but if we're gonna slow down, we're gonna read that text in, in, a, in a more concentrated, focused way. And I'm actually using technology, the kind of technology they don't necessarily use, but to do that kind of thing. 
I taught a course on Jewish images in which I received money from Harvard to buy three iPads and we had a table like this and we distributed those iPads and, student, and we could project onto a large screen those. And so as we're talking about images, students could do searches or put images up and we were, they were becoming the producers of the content that we were discussing. So this edited book, but it came out of a course in Modern Jewish Thought. We invited all these people in this book to come to my course in Modern Jewish Thought through Skype. So each week, I, you know, um, Noam Pionk was an expert in, in Mordechai Kaplan, this guy. Noam, what should we read in Mordechai Kaplan? He tells us what to read on Monday, and then Wednesday we read Noam Pionk's piece on Kaplan, and he Skypes into the class and we have a conversation with, with him. We did this each week with different authors, and then at the end they all come, they all came to Haverford, we had a symposium, they wrote a piece and came to this book. I don't lecture really too much in class. Um, I don't think it's good for them, and certainly boring for me, so it's it, it's a way of cultivating a certain kind of conversation and a, a creating kind of community of, con of conversance. I can tell they're thinking about religion in ways that they haven't thought about before. Using technology actually to do better humanistic inquiry within the classroom. It's not like eye candy. It's not like, oh, let's, let's use technology because it's fun. It's, it enables me to do something I couldn't do without. In the end of the day, the biggest capital we have are the people that are here, the faculty and staff and students. So we can change in whole sorts of ways. We can do all sorts of wonderful things in our curriculum, and we are. We're really trying to be progressive about that. But at the same time, it's, it's in the classroom. It's with my 10 or 15 students. We're arguing about something. That's what we've been doing. That's what this place is. When I was a student here, what it meant was sitting around a classroom with that professor, arguing about that text or working in that lab, and, and that's what we do.